if you go back and read through your Bible, you're going to find that there was something peculiar, a lot of things, but there was something peculiar about those people who were called the Jews. One thing that was peculiar about these people, and Paul noted it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, is that the Jews always wanted to see a sign. They always wanted a sign to prove whatever was going on was really what was going on. You go back to Judges chapter 6. There was a judge named Gideon. And God came to Gideon and said, The Lord is with you and you are going to deliver the people of God from the Midianites. And you know what Gideon wanted? He said, If that's true, show me a sign. They always wanted to see a sign. In 2 Kings chapter 20, there was a, a king by the name of Hezekiah. And the Lord told him that you're going to die. You go, go home and get your affairs in order. And, and Hezekiah prayed out to God and he begged God to spare his life and extend his life. And so God told Hezekiah, okay, I'm going to extend your life for 15 years. You know what Hezekiah wanted? 2 Kings chapter 20 he said, show me a sign. Give me a sign. I want to know that this is really going to happen. The Jews always wanted a sign. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is there in the, in the presence of, of the great temple there in Jerusalem. And, and, and Jesus is walking out of the temple and he says, there's not one stone standing upon another here that will not be torn down. He said, that day's coming. You know what Peter, Andrew, James, and John wanted? They said, they said Jesus, show us a sign. What's the only to be the sign when this temple is destroyed? And that's what Matthew chapter 24 is about. The Jews always wanted a sign. I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 2, to the passage that was read this morning. Because in John chapter 2, Jesus is in that temple. And as he's in that temple, he notices that the temple is being misused. And the temple of God is, is, is being used as a place of merchandise. And so Jesus drives out these money changers who are there exchanging money and, and charging an exorbitant amount of interest. Can you imagine anybody charging an exorbitant amount of interest? That wouldn't happen today, right? Well, they were doing it in the temple. Jesus drove them out. And Jesus said, don't you take my father's house and make it a house of merchandise. You know what the Jews wanted? Look in John chapter 2. When Jesus drove them out, look at John chapter 2 and verse 18. You know what the Jews wanted? They wanted a sign. They said, what sign will you show us since you do these things? Who gives you the right to do these things? Show us a sign. What was the sign? What was the sign that Jesus said? He was going to give them. It's an interesting sign. Because Jesus says in verse 19, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. He's in the temple. And he, they, they just asked him for a sign. And they, he says, okay, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. And what are they thinking? Wait a minute. What, this temple? We've been building this temple for 46 years, and it wasn't even done yet. It wasn't going to be done for another couple decades. We've been building this for 46 years, and you're going to rebuild it in three days? But you notice what the Bible tells us he was really talking about. He wasn't talking about that physical temple. He was talking about the temple of his body. And I want you to look in verse 22. Therefore, therefore when he had risen from the dead... When Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered. What did they do? They remembered that he had said this to them. And when they remembered, what else does verse 22 tell us that they did? They believed. Three years later, three years later when Jesus died and was buried and then was raised from the dead, the Bible says the disciples remembered what he said. And they believed what he said. Destroy this temple. In three days I'll rebuild it. That stuck with them. Would that stick with you? That stuck with the people. Three years later, when Jesus was on trial in Matthew chapter 26, three years later, they were bringing in false witnesses to lie against Jesus on trial. And there was a witness who came in. This man said he was going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. 
He said that three years earlier, but that guy still remembered it. When Jesus was hanging on the cross in Matthew chapter 27, he's been nailed to a cross. The Bible says the passers-by came by and they were wagging their heads at him. And here's what some of them were saying. You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. He had said that three years earlier. But it stuck with them. And John chapter 2 and verse 22 says, When he was raised from the dead, they put it together. When he was raised from the dead, they remembered what he had said. The resurrection of Jesus is the most powerful event that has ever happened on the face of this earth. The resurrection of Jesus is the most significant event that's ever happened on the face of this earth. Jesus dying on the cross is the event we remember every first day of the week, just as he told us to do, to do this in remembrance of me. But we remember it on the first day of the week because that's the day that he was raised from the dead. Do you know that he was raised? Do you believe that he was raised? The evidence is overwhelming that Jesus is raised from the dead. It's not just some kind of a rumor. It's just not something that somebody passed down as some good tradition or some bedtime story. Jesus died on that cross. The Romans were perfectionists at death. The Romans knew how to put somebody to death. They knew how to make sure that when they were on that cross, they died. He died on that cross. They took the body of Jesus and they laid that dead body that had had that spear thrust through and out came blood and water. They laid that dead body in a tomb and they rolled that stone in front of that tomb and that stone was sealed. It was not going to be opened. There were 16 guards stationed outside of that tomb and four different shifts of four different soldiers to make sure that tomb was not entered. He died And he was buried. But something happened that Sunday morning. There is a truth that cannot be denied. That tomb was empty. When they went there expecting to find his body, those women went there expecting his dead body to be there, that tomb was empty. He was not there. Instead, he appeared to them. The Bible tells us he was seen by people over and over and over and over. Not some figment of their imagination. He was in their presence. He, he, they, he touched, they touched his hands and his feet. He sat down and ate with them. This is the real Jesus who was dead three days ago, but is alive today. He was seen by witnesses. And it changed people's lives. There were people who were converted to Jesus who were his arch enemies. What made the difference? He was raised from the dead. The most powerful event in all of history happened that Sunday morning. We celebrate it every Sunday when we gather together on the first day of the week. Jesus promised, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He kept that promise in his resurrection. This morning, I want to share with you some promises that Jesus made. Promises that Jesus made that the Bible says we have absolute assurance in those promises because of the resurrection of Jesus. Not, oh, here's a promise. Wouldn't it be nice if it happened? The most powerful event in all of history that took place when Jesus was raised from the dead assures us that these promises are true. Let me share some with you, and I hope you'll get your Bibles and follow these with me as we look at some promises that we can have absolute assurance in because of the resurrection of Jesus. In in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus had asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And they had all sorts of different answers of who he was. But Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, based upon that bedrock truth that Jesus is the Son of God, I will build my church. Jesus had been talking about his church for years. Jesus had come along and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4 
in verse 17. He'd been talking about it all along, and now here in Matthew 16, 18, he does it again. I will build my church. His church was that kingdom that had been promised in the Old Testament. His church was that kingdom over which Jesus, the King of Kings, was reigning, Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. It was that kingdom that God had promised through the prophet Isaiah, that God had promised through the prophet Daniel, that God had promised through the prophet Nathan to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God had been talking about his kingdom for centuries. And now Jesus comes along and he says, I will build my church. And in Acts chapter 2, it becomes a reality. But how do we know? How do we know that Jesus has promised, I will build my church? How do we know that he really kept that promise? Turn your Bible to Acts chapter 2 with me. I want us to let Acts chapter 2 show us that the, the, the validity, the assurance of this promise that Jesus made, I will build my church, is found in his resurrection. And Acts chapter 2 is when Jesus, when Jesus' church, his kingdom, is established. And it's on this occasion where Peter and the apostles get up and preach. And do you know what they preach about? The central message of their sermon in Acts chapter 2 is the resurrection of Jesus. They tell them in Acts 2 and verse 22, they tell them that, God, that, that this Jesus was attested to you by God by miracles and wonders and signs. But he tells them in verse 23, you crucified him. You put him to death, but verse 24, what did God do? God raised him up. The church is going to be established in Acts chapter 2. What's the assurance that Jesus is keeping his promise? God raised him up. And the rest of this sermon is about the resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 25. David in the Old Testament says concerning Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Jesus' soul was not left in Hades. You've made known to me the way of life. You make me full of joy in your presence. And listen to what Peter says in verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. David who just wrote this. He says, let me speak, speak freely to you. He says, David is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. Peter, what's your point in saying that? David just said this, but David is dead. Well, then who is David talking about? Verse 30, therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of David's body, according to the flesh, one of his descendants, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. The church was established in Acts 2, fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus, the promise of Jesus, I will build my church, but it was validated by the resurrection of Jesus. Every promise Jesus made, you can be absolutely assured of it because he is not dead and buried in the grave. That Sunday morning, he came back to life and he was raised by our God. In John 2, it says, when Jesus' disciples saw Jesus raised from the dead, they remembered and they believed. Do you believe that Jesus established his church? Do you remember the promise that he made? Do you know that his church is on this earth today? That passage in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That has all sorts of possible meanings. One possible meaning is Jesus' soul was in Hades for those three days, but his soul was not going to be kept in Hades because when he was raised from the dead, it was assurance that his church was going to be established. Are you a part of that church? Are you a part of the church that Jesus promised, that was assured by his resurrection? 
and was established on the day of, of, on the day of Pentecost? Let me share with you another promise. Look in John chapter 14. John chapter 14 may be one of your favorite verses in all of the Bible. In John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, Jesus tells his disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. What does he say in verse 3? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. This is just hours before Jesus is going to be killed. John 14 is just hours before Jesus is going to be crucified on a cross. And what does he say to them? I will come again. He's talking about the second coming. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. From the moment that Jesus said that, throughout New Testament times and all the way through to today, there have been all sorts of people who have been very skeptical. Really? Jesus is coming back? Do you know any people that maybe scoff at the idea that Jesus is going to come back? 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter wrote about a whole group of people that were making fun of the idea that Jesus was coming back. And their mentality was, where's the evidence? Their mentality was, we don't see it happening. Nothing's changed. He made this promise and here we are today. Nothing's changed. Here we are 2,000 years later. Could people make the same argument? Yeah, he said he was coming back, but where is he? Nothing's changed. We haven't seen anything come about yet. How do we know that Jesus is going to keep this promise? Turn your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Go to the New Testament, little book of 1 Thessalonians, in the middle of, of, of your New Testament. And I want us to see that God assures us of this promise. And guess what the assurance is? Guess what the foundation is? The book of 1 Thessalonians as a whole has as its theme the second coming of Jesus. So I want, I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and look at the very last verse of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. These people that Paul is writing to, he tells them in verse 9 that they had turned from God. They had turned to God from idols. They had turned to serve the living and true God. And what were they doing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1? You've come to God to wait for His Son, the second coming. You're waiting on that promise that He would come back. How do they know that He's going to come back? You wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead. Even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. How can we know that He's going to come back? Here we are waiting. How can we know that He's going to come back? Because God raised Him from the dead. In Revelation chapter 1, you read this, the, the statements of Jesus about who he is. You read in Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus says, I am, I was, and I, I'm the one who's going to come again. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, he's described as the one who is and who was and who is to come. But in verse 5, He's described, Jesus is, as the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. Here's Jesus who was raised from the dead. And what assurance do we have based upon that? He says in verse 7 that he's coming again and he's coming quickly. Jesus said, I'm going to come again. I know there may be people today that don't believe that. But in John chapter 2 and verse 22, when Jesus' disciples saw him raised from the dead, they remembered what he said. They believed what he said. Do you believe that Jesus is going to come back? Do you believe that he's going to come back just in the very way that the Bible tells us that he would, that he will come as a thief in the night? Do you believe that he's going to come as Jesus said he would suddenly when no one is expecting him, are we ready for that day? Because Jesus not only promised, I will come again in John 14, but earlier in John chapter 6, he had been telling people, those who would be his followers, he said, I will raise them up in the last day. Jesus made a promise that when he comes back, all of those who are dead, 
are going to be raised from the dead. Have you ever seen somebody raised from the dead? You can shake your head this way. Have you ever seen somebody raised from the dead? No, we haven't seen anybody raised. That doesn't happen. How can we know that Jesus is really going to raise people from the dead? We've never seen it happen because of the promise that Jesus made. How can we have assurance that Jesus is going to keep this promise? You know, as Christians, we have a living hope. And that living hope, 1 Peter 1 and verse 3 tells us, is based upon the resurrection of Jesus. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you may recognize that as, as, the, as the, uh, the resurrection chapter, I want you to be reminded of what some other passages say, like 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and, uh, or 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 14 that tells us that we can know that we will be raised up because of God who raised up Jesus. Just as He raised up Jesus, we can know that He will raise, up us, raise us up as well. But in that, in that 1 Corinthians 15 passage, look in verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead. He had spent the first 19 verses saying, well, what if this really didn't happen? But he spent those first 19 verses proving that it happened. Look in verses, especially verses 5 through 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul says, he was seen, he was seen, he was seen, he was seen. He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, most of whom still abide. Go and ask them, Paul is saying. There's evidence for his resurrection. We know we're eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Verse 20, therefore, he says, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does that mean? As assured as we can be that Jesus was raised from the dead, he was only the first. He was only the first to be raised from the dead, never to die again. We also will be raised from the dead, never to die again. We've never seen somebody raised from the dead. How can I know that Jesus is going to keep that promise? God in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 guarantees that promise based upon the resurrection of Jesus. It's the most powerful event in all of history. When the disciples saw the resurrected Lord, John 2 tells us, they remembered. Yes, okay, now I got it. And they believed. Do you believe the day is coming? Where Jesus is not only going to come back, but every grave is going to be opened. Do you believe that day is coming? We know it's coming. We are assured that it's coming just as sure as he was raised from the dead. Every other person is going to be raised. Well, what's going to happen after that? What's going to happen after Jesus comes back? What's going to happen after he raises everybody from the dead? You know another promise Jesus made? Matthew chapter 25. Another promise Jesus made. He's talking about himself in the third person. He says, when the Son of Man comes, Matthew 25 verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of his holy angels with him, then he will sit. What's he going to do? A promise. He will sit on the throne of his glory. What does somebody do on the throne of his glory? He's going to judge. He will sit on the throne of His glory and all nations will be gathered before Him. He will sit, promise. All nations will be gathered before Him, promise. And He will, promise, He will separate them one from another as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And He will, promise, set the sheep on His right hand and the goats on His left hand. Verse 34, and the king will say, promise, He will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for, the de prepared for you from the beginning of the foundation of the world. A promise. A promise in verse 41, he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me. Depart from me? He's going to say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father. He's going to say to those on his right hand, Depart from me, you cursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus promised that he is going to come back. And when Jesus comes back, the Bible says every one of us
going to stand before him on the day of judgment. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 says, We shall all, A-L-L, everybody, no exclusions from this, we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be crowded there, isn't it? We shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one, there's the sea of people in the word all, all will be there. And then the word each one points out the individual. That each one in that sea of all, that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. That day is coming. Jesus promised that day is coming Well, he will sit on the throne of judgment and everybody will be gathered before him. But how can I know? How can I know that's real? I mean, how can I know he's really going to do that? you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 17? Get your Bibles. I want you to see this in Acts chapter 17. I want you to see how we can have absolute assurance Jesus is coming back. We can have absolute assurance all the dead are going to be raised. But I, I, I've never stood in judgment before Jesus before. How, how do I know that's going to happen? Look in Acts chapter 17. The Bible says in Acts chapter 17 beginning in verse 30, Truly, These times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men, the same number of people who are going to stand before Him on judgment, He now commands all men everywhere to do what? To repent. A command of God is for everybody to get their life right with Him. Well, why does He command everybody to repent? Don't stop reading at the end of verse 30. I've got a comma at the end of verse 30. It doesn't stop at the end of verse 30. My First word in verse 31 is the word because. God now commands everybody to repent. God, why do you command everybody to repent? Well, he tells us, because he has appointed a day. What day? A day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. God has appointed a day. You have any appointments this week? Some of you have got a calendar on your refrigerator. It's got all of your appointments for the week. Aren't you excited for all of those appointments you've got this week? Somewhere on God's calendar, He's got Judgment Day marked. Wouldn't you like to know when it is? Wouldn't you like to peer onto God's calendar? Somewhere on God's calendar, He has appointed the day of judgment on which we will all stand before Jesus on the day of judgment. I don't know, though. How can I be sure that's going to happen? What does verse 31 say? He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The most powerful, significant event that's ever happened on the face of this earth, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, guarantees and assures us that the day's coming. You may not believe it now. You'll believe it then. The day is coming where all of us are going to stand before Jesus on the day of judgment. And he proves it by raising Jesus from the dead. Those disciples didn't understand everything when Jesus said it. But when he was raised from the dead, they remembered and they believed. Do you believe the day is coming? Jesus is going to fulfill his promise and he's going to come back. Do you believe the day is coming? Jesus is going to fulfill his promise and everyone who's dead is going to be raised. Do you believe the day is coming where Jesus will fulfill his promise and we will all stand before him on the day of judgment? Are you ready for that day? We know it's coming. We know it's coming because he was raised from the dead. Fifth and final promise I want us to look at this morning. It's a promise that Jesus made in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, Jesus says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. It's a promise. It is a conditional promise. It is a promise of salvation to everyone who believes and is baptized that they will be saved. But notice that the promise of Jesus is conditional. But I want you to note that all of God's promises from the beginning of time have been conditional. God made promises to the the Israelites in the Old Testament. They were conditional. God makes promises to us in the New Testament. They're conditional. Here's a promise that's conditional. 
Jesus says, you will be saved. Well, how can I be saved? I've got to meet his conditions. What are his conditions? You got your Bibles? We're going to tie all of this into the resurrection. Every bit of this promise, every bit of the fulfillment, Jesus says, this will save you. Well, how do I know? How can I trust Jesus that what he says, this is really going to save me? Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. We're going to tie all of this to the resurrection. Jesus ties all of this to the resurrection. Romans chapter 10. You have Paul talking to these individuals about the fact that the word of God is right there with them. They don't have to go to some far distant place to find the truth of God. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 8, he said the word of God is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. And so when you have that word, when you have that truth, notice what he says in verse 9. In the middle of verse 9, he says, you need to believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. The same condition Jesus gave in Mark 16, 16 is the condition that's listed here. In order for me to be saved, the last word I have in verse 9 in my Bible is the word saved. In order to be saved, I must believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Do you believe that? The evidence is overwhelming that it happened. Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? That's not the only condition that God gives. But notice how he ties the resurrection into the fulfillment of the promise of salvation. What else do I need to do? Are there any other conditions that I need to meet? Well, what did we see in Acts chapter 17? God now commands all men everywhere to repent before the day of judgment comes. And how did he give assurance of that? By the resurrection of Jesus. So I take these passages and I put them together. And I see Jesus made a promise to save me. And that promise to save me, he says, I need to believe that God raised him from the dead. And that promise to save me, he says, I need to repent. What does that mean? I've got to look at my life and realize if I continue down the path that I'm traveling, I'm not going to heaven. Repentance is a decision that a person needs to make that says, I need to stop doing what's wrong and I need to start doing what's right. I need to look at my sin and realize my sin is a violation of the will of God, and my sin separates me from God. I don't want to deal, I don't want my sin anymore. I want to turn away from my sin, and I want to turn my life in the direction of God. Have you ever made that decision? Have you ever made that decision to repent? God says, I've got to do that in order to be saved. But look, are you still in Romans chapter 10? That's not the only condition in Romans chapter 10. What did he say at the beginning of verse 9? That if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. Jesus is Lord, how? Why? Because he was raised from the dead. I confess that I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What's the proof that he's the Son of God? He was raised from the dead. Every bit of this is tied to his resurrection. The conditions of salvation are tied to his resurrection. I've got to believe. I've got to repent. I've got to confess my faith. Is that all that I need to do? Well, notice in Mark 16, 16, that's not all that Jesus lists. But I want you to turn your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at two more passages this morning, and the lesson's yours. Turn your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 3. As you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, I want to ask you a question. Is baptism necessary? Is baptism essential? Is baptism absolutely required in order to be saved? Here's what some people are going to say. Some people are going to say yes. Some people are going to say no. You don't have to be baptized in order to be saved. What I want to do this morning is I want to let the Bible answer that question. Not me, not you, not anybody in this room. I want to let the Bible answer that question. And I want us to see this morning that the answer is tied to his resurrection. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, tells us about that occasion when Noah and his family, what does the end of 1 Peter 3 and verse 20 say? Noah and his family were saved. Do you remember when Noah and his family were saved? They were saved back in Genesis chapter 7, 8, and 9. What does 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20 tell us they were saved through? They were saved through water. 
We think it was the boat that saved them. This verse tells us that they were saved through water. What were they saved? They were saved from that evil, sinful world. It's the Bible that tells us they were saved through water. Verse 21, Peter says, let me tell you why I'm talking about Noah. It's not just a history lesson. Let me tell you why I'm talking about Noah. There is, the New King James says, an antitype. There is something today that corresponds to that. Well, what corresponds to Noah being saved through water? There's something that corresponds to Noah being saved through water, and it's baptism. Look at what he says in verse 21. Baptism does now save us. Is baptism, same words I asked you before, is baptism necessary to be saved, essential to be saved, absolutely required to be saved? This verse says baptism now saves us. If I say that baptism does not save us, I am saying something different than what the Bible says. The Bible says baptism saves. But, you know, seriously, being baptized, it's just water. I mean, it's just being put underwater and coming up out of water. I mean, how, how do I know that I really need to do that? What does this verse say? In your Bible, you might have some parentheses in verse 21 that tells us that baptism is not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of a pure conscience toward God. That's in parentheses. Or you might have some, some, uh, some dashes that separate that. So here's, here's what the sentence says without the parentheses in verse 21. Baptism does now save us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is it that gives power to baptism? Not the water. What is it that gives power to baptism? It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The most powerful, significant event that's ever happened. When I'm baptized, it's the blood of Jesus that washes away my sins, the blood that he shed in his death on the cross. But that has no power at all without his resurrection from the dead. I must be baptized. Why? So that I can come in contact with the blood that he shed on the cross so that that blood can wash away my sins so that the power of his resurrection can be manifested in my life. Are you sure? Last passage, Romans chapter 6. Got your Bibles? Last passage. The quicker you get there, the quicker this sermon will be over. Romans chapter 6. Oh, you were listening. Romans chapter 6. Paul ties it all together. What shall we say then, chapter 6? Verse 1, shall we consent, continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin when we repented and got rid of sin live any longer in it? Verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Can I, can I benefit from the death of Jesus? Can I benefit from the blood of Jesus in his death if I am not baptized? Not according to Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, I cannot. Therefore, verse 4, we were buried. Notice that baptism is a burial. We were buried with him. Remember, Jesus died. We died to sin. Jesus was buried. When we're baptized, we're buried in the water. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Look at what verse 4 says. That just as Christ was what? Raised from the dead. He ties it together. By the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Jesus was raised from the dead. When I'm baptized, I am raised from the watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. What does verse 5 say? For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, surely we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Baptism has power because of the death of Jesus and the blood that he shed, and that's where my sins are forgiven, is when I am buried with him into his death, where he shed that blood and he forgives me of all of my sins. But that has no power without Jesus being raised from the dead. And when I am raised, I am united together in the likeness of his resurrection. I become one with him, and as he lived again and walked again, I live again and walk again in a brand new life. Have you ever been baptized in order for that to happen? Have you ever been baptized so that the blood of Jesus would wash away all of your sins, so that you would begin a new life 
free from sin in Christ. That's the only way for it to happen. And it's guaranteed. That promise is guaranteed by the resurrection of Christ. Where are you today? Are you right with God today? The song we're going to sing in just a moment is Trust and Obey, one of my favorite invitation songs. Trust and Obey. Do you trust the promises of God? Do you trust the promises of Jesus? I will build my church. He did. I will come again. He will. I will raise the dead. I will judge all mankind. If you will believe and are baptized, you'll be saved and ready for that judgment. His promises are guaranteed by His resurrection. Do you trust Him? Have you obeyed Him? There's no other way for you to be happy in Jesus if you haven't done that. Today, if you need to be baptized for the remission of all of your sins, there's water here. We have garments and towels here. Everything is ready for you to trust and obey Him today. If you've already done that, but your life has not been walking where it needs to walk and doing what it needs to do, if you need to get back right with God today, you also can come today. And ask for the prayers of this church, and we'll pray with you and for you that you can get back right with God. If you need to respond to this song of invitation, do it right now as together we stand and sing.